Well, are you mad at your, quote, family in the sense of your niece, I guess it was, who really started this whole awful ball rolling? What's your relationship? Are you, where are you with that? You know, this is uh, where I have to jump in and say that's a very fair question, but because it's a pending case, we're yeah. in real time. Uh, these are witnesses that we may be questioning in the courtroom at some point. We really can't, can't talk about that right now. Okay, that's um, fair. Christy, we've, um, we've talked a little bit about it in the past. You've had a scholarship, I guess, to veterinary school. And when did that happen, first of all? And what are you doing now? And what's next for you and, and your parents? Where do we all stand on this? Uh, yeah, um, right after I graduated, I went to uh, Texas A&M University. Right. Um, started school there. Yes, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Okay. Um, I had taken a break from school and um, started working at uh, HEB. That's where I met Cassie and through Cassie. Um, and also uh, Jolene was another friend, which right. I went to school with um, Liz and um, Anna. And through them, I met Anna and um, Liz. And then, let's see, that was in... What, 1993 and then like 1994 we got uh, accused of this so just been going through that whole situation since 1994 will you go back to your interest in veterinarian medicine and um i don't know about that i do want to go back to school but i'm not too sure if i'll go to i don't know I just but go, you do want to go back i feel like i'm too old for that <laughs> yeah but yeah. I, I do i do i miss school I'm, i like uh I like the education, you know, so I just don't do it right now since I've been out because I don't feel like I can focus properly like I need to. And I don't know exactly what could happen, you know, there's a possibility that we could go back to prison. So um, I think until like all of this is over, then I can, I can focus yeah. clearly like I need to, you know, towards my education. This is such an awkward environment the guys are coming to be on the stage but i just i wanted to thank you for for love for loving each other and for knowing the truth and for letting us share in that piece of your strength and for the goddamn fortitude that you guys are showing i just it is unbelievable and it is deeply moving and i am it defies words so, but the love that you have for each other and your family is so clear. So, thank you for holding to that. Well said. Thank you. I do have a question. I did want to say that I applaud the four of you for not letting anger and hatred fester inside. I agree that that's no that's way to live. Um, in that vein, there was um, the film did a good job of showing the forgiveness for one of the two accusers, but um, we learned from the documentary that the other accuser didn't want to have anything to do with the film. What went on behind the scenes with the second accuser, and where I know you can't divulge too much, but where is that person in this whole process? Yeah, you know, once again, it's, it, that is a very fair and interesting question. It, it's just, once again, because we're in real time, we may be in a courtroom cross-examining her. Uh, you know, if this case gets remanded, we really can't talk about that right now. And the filmmakers can't talk about it since they're not no. in no. No. It's it's people. people. It's not a film. It's, you want to jeopardize. it's a good question, but it's, a I, it's the same question that's been asked at least twice that I've been at, and the answer's been twice the same. And in, the, in the litigation process, it's just too sensitive right now. Yeah, back there? Uh, two questions. Sure. Unre two questions unrelated. One is, uh, there's a line in the film that says the LGBT community was too late to contact them. Why is it ever too late? And what was the mobilization of that community towards your support? And then the second, uh, I think it's an unrelated question, uh, what the fact that your Latino affect the mobilization of people in the civil rights movement in Texas, whatever that may be, 
do you think that had an effect on mobilizing behind you? Sam, you want to? Or Ed? Um, yeah, I'll take that. Um, so let me paint the picture for you. We're 1994. We're in San Antonio, Texas. Very conservative, you know, Republican nation. And they do not like the LGBT community. So when I had said that line, that it was a little too late when we got a hold of them, it was. We were 19 to 21. You know, we were out to ourselves, but not really in public. In San Antonio, you lived in fear, you lived in hiding. The only time that you came out was to your closest friends or, to, or at a club. And with that, you feared being in the club because of all the gay bastions that was going on back then. I mean, you can imagine 1994 and then being in San Antonio. So, you know, the LGBTQ community is not what it is now. And the part about being Latina lesbians, well, that played a part in our defense. We had no money, you know. To this day, my mother had paid off her home in the 70s. And to this day, she still has a mortgage because she tried to help me. And we lost. So we, we you know, we had very little money to help us. And, um, that's just the way it was back then, you know. I mean, it's it's so different now. You know, LGBT community has um, gotten on board with us, and and are helping now, and we're seeing a lot of help from the Latina community as well. And Glad, you know, is is a part of us now, and and it's just a wonderful feeling. But it just wasn't there back then. Got it. Another question. <clears throat> back. Yeah. In the back, all the way in the back. Uh, ladies, uh, thank you, and thank you to the filmmakers. When y'all were doing your bid, um, what, 16 years or so, did you share um, your plight with the other members of the incarcerated community, and was there like any, any support on the inside for what y'all were trying to do? It was really hard to share our story with people on the inside because of the accusations. Being a child molester in prison means it's the worst crime. Um, I believe it was Adam one time that said, uh, they like murderers more than they do child molesters. You can go in there and you could have murdered somebody and they're gonna be all right with you. But once you walk through the door and you have that label, it's over, you know? So it wasn't easy to share our story with people. Um, I don't think any of us really did. We were kind of afraid, you know, cause I mean, you're looked at, you're looked at really, really badly. But I think in time, you know, after you make friends in there, because those people become your family. We did many years with them, you know, and there's some that you can trust. There's some that you grow bonds with, and you do talk to them about it. And um, I even talked to officers about it, and I had officers tell me that they prayed for us and that they hoped that everything worked out and that we were released because they even believed that we were innocent, you know, because we weren't bad people. We weren't like other inmates, you know, we weren't trying to. We did what we had to. We just kept fighting our case. And they saw that because we were constantly writing letters to people, trying to get attention, trying to get awareness, just somebody that would help us just to listen to our story so that we could prove that we were innocent. So that's crazy. Uh, red shirt in the back there, and then. All right, uh, first of all, we admire you so much. Um, when you're together, the four of you who have uh, and you were apart for so long. What do you talk about now? Is it just the four of you or together? Do you talk about your time in prison or that taboo stuff? <laughs> I think now we talk a lot about our families and catching up. Uh, when we see each other, we talk about our accomplishments now that we're home. Um, we're more focused on Basically, what we do talk a lot about is this, though, because this is a big part of our lives, and it's going to be, we, you know, for a very long time, because we want to help others that are in situations like ours, you know, because we know that there are very many people that are still incarcerated, doing time for things that they did not do, and our mission in life is to create a movement so that we can stop it. So, I think that this brought us together for a reason, and we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a change in life. Hi. I would like to hug each and one of, every one of you. Um, 
I have a couple of questions. One, were you separated in prison? You had no contact with each other? And why? Do you have any idea? Do you know why, Anna, you were released uh, on parole and the others weren't? Certainly not Cassie and, and Chrissy. Um, are you as close now as you were before you were imprisoned? And for my sake, I hope you are all uh, for your mental health, I hope you are all seeing somebody because you cannot possibly be not emotionally and probably psychologically damaged by the injustice that you have suffered for so many years. I applaud you all. Go ahead, Anna. Okay, so uh, let's start backwards. Separate. Uh, no, we are not seeing anybody for mental health. Um, the second one, are we as close? I think we're as close as we can be due to life. Um, we all have different jobs, we all have different relationships, different work schedules, so it's really nice when we're here together because we're actually together. Um, other than that, it's, it's just life. You know, you could be best friends with your, you know, the best friend from high school and then you get married, you have kids, you know, things just, it, it's just life. But I think we're as close as we can be, you know, and it, it's, like I say, we really enjoy being together when we do come out to um, film venues. And the reason why I think, um, you know, if, if I can tell you, I, just, I think it was a God. I think it was a, a higher power that helped me to be free and helped me to advocate for the three friends that I left behind. Um, I also believe that because I was in a sex offender program that my polygraphs that Mike, our attorney, had us taken helped with the sex offender treatment program because they look so highly at those polygraphs. And it shows that we are not capable of something like this. Not only that, but any kind of illegal, you know, like they said in, in court, you know, any, anything illegal. And the very first question was what now? I forgot. You forgot. I think that's it. <laughs> oh, the, the, yes. Um, so Liz and I were at the hobby unit together. But Liz was tried before us, before the three of us. So they sent her to the hobby unit. Well, when the three of us got tried, um, in TDCJ, they try to keep co-defendants apart. So the three of us were separated, and I think they just kind of lost touch of Liz being at the hobby unit. If they would have known, I'm almost positive they would have sent me to another unit. They wouldn't have put me at the same unit as her. 